Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the CEO of Tomoh Advisory, His Excellency Dr. Basim Awadala, and his panelists. Good afternoon. Like uh, most of you, I've been to many conferences over the years, and uh, I've never seen a closing session with so many attendees. Ahlan wa sahlan. Before starting our session, I think after we saw the best of, we really have to acknowledge that we've had an incredible three days in this FII. It's been an amazing three days. Thank you to His Majesty King Salman. Thank you to His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Thank you Yasser Mayan and his incredible team of PIF young women and men. All the ministries, all the different departments in Saudi Arabia, especially the Royal Guards, incredible people. <laughs> Royal Protocol, and also last but not least, Richard Atias and his great team. Thank you very, very much. We owe you gratitude. This is the closing session, and uh, I suppose they saved the best for the last, Excellencies. Um, it is my distinct privilege to moderate this very important session of G20 diplomacy. In one month, Saudi Arabia will assume the leadership of the group of 20. This is a group that represents 85% of world GDP, 75% of world trade, and two-thirds of the world population. This is how big the group is. And Saudi Arabia hosts and assumes the leadership of this uh, G20 group at a time when it is undergoing a massive transformation as it reflects the ambitions of its youth, of its leadership, to carve a future for not only Saudi Arabia and its economy, but for the entire region. So we wish you all the best in this new leadership role for the G20, Your Excellency. Also, when Saudi Arabia assumes this uh, leadership role, the world is going through very uncertain times. We are witnessing global trade wars. We are witnessing technological disruptions. We are witnessing social revolts and strife around the world. And we are witnessing an amazing a group of new youth, youthful forces that are looking and yearning for hope and for a better future. So as we look at global growth, the IMF has review, revisited and reviewed their outlook for global growth to 3.2% this year, 3.5% uh, next year. So this is, these are challenging times. And to help us understand what Saudi Arabia is going to offer to the G20, how it's going to deal with these global challenges, uh, what the G20 can offer, how it will be able to have an impact on these global events. We have a very, very impressive panel of uh, amazing people. His Excellency Dr. Ibrahim al assaf Minister of State, member of the Council of Ministers of Saudi Arabia, former Minister of Finance, former Minister of Foreign Affairs. I think, sir, you have <coughs> attended every single G20 meeting since it started. So thank you very, very much for joining us today. We have the Right Honorable David Cameron, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. It is a very, very big pleasure to have you here, sir. Son Excellence uh, uh, Francois Fillon, the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of France. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. 
the Honourable Kevin Rudd, the Prime Minister, former Prime Minister of Australia. It is a distinct privilege to welcome you, sir. And uh, His Excellency Mr. Matteo Rezzi, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I would like to start with the genesis of the G20. And um, Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Rudd, your memoirs, the memoirs that you wrote and you published last year, um, you wrote about the genesis of the G20 and how it evolved and the impact it had on the financial crisis and how to meet the financial crisis in 2008. I would like you to share with us, if I may, the genesis of this group, and more importantly, perhaps, is the G20 still relevant today? Does it have an impact on global events today in 2019 and 2020 during the Saudi leadership of this group? Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think all of us wish the kingdom um, all the best in its uh, major global responsibilities in hosting the G20 in the year ahead. This is an important task not just for the kingdom, but for the world. I think uh, Francois and I were probably G20 veterans. We were there at the beginning. Um, it's important for us all to reflect that the genesis of the G20 was the global financial crisis of 2008, where we faced the real risk that what was a crisis in financial markets was going to create not just a global recession, which it became, but the real risk of it tumbling into a global depression. It was a massive shock to the global financial and economic system. And I remember our discussions with President Bush at the time, where his conclusion was the existing framework of the G7 did not represent sufficient critical mass of the emerging global economy to respond effectively to a financial and economic crisis of that scale. And he was right, and I give him credit for that. And then there was a debate about, well, if it's not a G7, what should it be? Um, a G12, uh, uh, a G15, or a G20, building on an earlier forum of finance ministers which had come out of the Asian financial crisis a decade before. And uh, I remember having lots of uh, animated discussions and disagreements with uh, Francois Olbas, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, about whether it was to be this small, a G12, excluding L'Australie, um, or that big, a G20, including not just ourselves, but uh, Indonesia, South Korea, as well as countries uh, from the Muslim world, uh, in addition to Indonesia, like the Kingdom, like Turkey, etc. And to give um, President uh, Bush great credit, he decided it was best to have a sustainable representative institution which brought together the global economy in all its diversity. The powerhouses of continuing Europe, the emerging powerhouses of emerging Asia, and the other strong economies of both uh, the Gulf and Latin America as well. But I'll just conclude with this reflection in answer to your question. As we look forward to the agenda for the 2020 G20, uh, let us not lose sight of its fundamental mandate on maintaining global financial stability and sustainable and balanced economic growth. Ten years ago this month, we agreed on that at the Pittsburgh summit as the mandate for the G20 for the future. And if I look at the future on finance alone, we still have problems about stability of financial systems, capital adequacy of financial institutions, financial stability to board, board, which we created 10 years ago, is doing a good job. But the new systemic financial challenges too, like our future regulation of cryptocurrencies, of uh, stablecoin, of Bitcoin, or what other form of digital currency may emerge. These are big systemic challenges. So for the future, whatever other issues are attached to the agenda for the G20 for the year ahead, in climate and the rest, the core must still remain global financial stability and the sustained growth of our global economy. Thank you. 
Prime Minister, the, when we look at the global outlook, the global economic outlook, when we look at the global uh, the trade wars that are taking place right now, when the leaders meet after an, a year's uh, effort with Sherpas and meetings and, and efforts, what, what do you think the G20 can look at in terms of providing ways and means for the globe, for the global economy to grow? How can it grow? What, what are the actual effective mechanisms that need to be tabled there? Well, I, I agree with Kevin that I think the G20, when it was born in 2008 and 9, did some really brilliant work at preventing um, a global economic meltdown. And I think the work it did after 2009, and I attended six G20s from 2010 to 2016, it carried on with some important work on global stability. It got the parties around the table to talk about protectionism and the dangers of protectionism. But I think if we're frank, actually the G20s have been a bit disappointing ever since the London ones. We've always been effective at getting together to talk about the current crisis, whether that's uh, the war in Syria or whether it's the trade war between China and America. But uh, my advice would be looking at the opportunities Saudi Arabia has at, at chairing the G20 and congratulations on, on that role and indeed for holding this conference, is I think that one of the things you can do with these international gatherings is actually think hard about the issues you want to promote that will make a real difference. And, and do that all the way through to the, the conference itself. And if I was to be so bold, I would say absolutely plan for a G20 where trade and the potential trade wars between China and America and ongoing wars are gonna be a huge feature. Plan for a G20 when you talk about continued worries and instability in the financial systems. But I would also pick some issues that you can make a real difference on. And I would, I would perhaps highlight two. Um, of course, while we examine what's going wrong in Western politics and what's going wrong in advanced economies, the real problem in the world is still the division between the rich countries and the poorest countries. We're coming up for uh, another look at um, the uh, sustainable development goals. And I think if all the G20 is, is just a sort of checklist of how we're doing, we're missing out on something, which is looking at those countries the so-called fragile states that are nowhere near meeting any of these goals. And what is it that G20 countries can do together to try and help those really challenged countries, the Burundis, the Sierra Leones, the Liberias, the Somalias, because that could make a real difference to our world. And linked to that, I think there's another issue where Saudi Arabia perhaps could make a real difference, which is asking the question, how do we ensure in these countries and elsewhere that natural resources are a blessing and not a curse. What is it that you've done here and that other countries like Norway and others have done, setting up sovereign wealth funds, making sure these resources are used for long-term investment and long-term goals? And what is it that some countries aren't doing? And linked to that is the whole agenda of um, how companies report and transparency and making sure that these, these things are done properly. I think those sorts of agendas but actually, if you run them from now right up to next October, you can make a real impact, a long-term impact, uh, rather than just discussing the sort of current crises, whether in trade or in, in, um, in, in finances. But it's, it is a great opportunity. I chaired the G8 uh, back in 2013 in Northern Ireland, and we planned long in advance for some issues we wanted to raise, principally about companies and how they pay taxes. And that moved what is a sort of second order agenda for many, but it moved that agenda right up to the front. And that's the opportunity you have when you're in the chair. But issues like social justice, <clears throat> issues like social justice, issues like inequality are also happening within countries, members of the G20. As we saw uh, Prime Minister Fillon in France with, uh, with the Gilets Jaunes and with uh, other countries as well. So do you think the G20 can be also a platform where issues of social justice are actually looked at, where inequalities within countries are looked at? Uh, <clears throat> so thank you. It's a great honor to be here uh, and to participate to this event and to answer to the question of my friend, the former finance minister of Jordan, which whom I used to work when I was in office. Uh, but now I am going to speak in French. Please because I think I am clever when I speak in French. <laughs> 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 
You speak English perfectly, but please yeah. go ahead. So if you can just... Uh... <laughs> quand, quand on regarde les résultats des derniers G20, on peut s'interroger sur l'efficacité de cette formule et de cette organisation. Quand on voit qu'un communiqué du G20 peut être détruit en une seconde par un tweet présidentiel, on peut s'interroger sur la pertinence de ce rassemblement, de cette réunion. Mais en même temps, quand on y réfléchit bien aussi, le multilatéralisme est en train de voler en éclats partout. L'Organisation mondiale du commerce est fragilisée, l'Union européenne est affaiblie par ses débats internes et par le risque de départ de la Grande-Bretagne. L'OTAN se pose la question de savoir si cette organisation a encore un avenir. Et l'ONU, en tout cas le Conseil de sécurité, est paralysé par le droit de veto. Et donc, la nécessité d'avoir des endroits, des lieux où euh, on peut se parler, où on peut aller au-delà euh, euh, de cette confrontation euh, qui euh, met à l'écart euh, des parties entières euh, du, du globe et qui provoque euh, des tensions supplémentaires est absolument indispensable. Euh, pour que le G20 réussisse, il faut d'abord qu'ils choisissent de façon très précise les sujets qui doivent être abordés et qui ne cherchent pas à évoquer tous les, toutes les questions. Le, le G20, ce n'est pas l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies. Et je rejoins ce que disait euh, David tout à l'heure. Euh, la question de savoir si le G20 doit aborder les injustices, les inégalités sociales, euh, les révoltes qui apparaissent de plus en plus euh, autour de nous, c'est une question qui doit être posée d'une manière différente. Pourquoi est-ce qu'on assiste à ces révoltes En fait, parce que les peuples ont peur. Ils ont peur de l'avenir. La globalisation a déplacé de façon partielle les richesses. L'immigration secoue les modèles culturels. Et il y a maintenant cette peur du réchauffement climatique et des désordres climatiques qui... Euh, inquiète les générations futures. Et dans ce contexte, euh, beaucoup de peuples, au fond, choisissent de se replier sur ce qui est pour eux euh, le plus sûr, c'est-à-dire leur communauté. Ça peut être une communauté géographique. Ce sont tous les mouvements euh, euh, comme euh, l'indépendance de la Catalogne ou les revendications de l'Italie du Nord ou euh, des Flandres ou... Ça peut être les communautés religieuses, avec la montée d'une forme d'intolérance et de sectarisme. C'est les communautés ethniques, c'est même les communautés sociales, puisque, au fond, si on regarde aujourd'hui, en tout cas dans les grandes villes occidentales, il n'y a jamais eu autant de ségrégation sociale. Les riches ne rencontrent jamais de pauvres, sauf ceux qui viennent travailler chez eux. Et, et, et c'est l'ensemble de ces phénomènes qui créent les révoltes auxquelles on assiste. Et il est évident que les chefs d'État des plus grands pays du monde doivent adresser cette question, mais ils doivent l'adresser d'une manière qui ne soit pas formelle, c'est-à-dire en offrant des solutions. Et ces solutions, elles sont dans le développement économique, elles sont dans une plus grande liberté pour les individus, elles sont dans le soutien au progrès technologique. Et enfin, pour finir sur les conditions de réussite du G20, je pense que le G20 doit être une organisation souple capable de s'adapter aux évolutions du monde. Euh, c'est la France qui a inventé, euh, euh, je ne sais plus si ça s'appelait le G4 ou le G5, qui est devenu le G7. Puis ensuite, il y a eu euh, cette volonté d'élargir euh, ce club à des pays qui avaient euh, accédé au, au développement euh, et à la puissance. Eh bien, ce mouvement va continuer. Et demain, le G20 ne pourra pas être exactement celui qu'il est. Et donc, il faut que le G20 ait cette souplesse d'organisation, d'adaptation qui lui permet d'épouser les changements du monde. Merci beaucoup. Prime Minister, the Prime Minister Cameron said that since London, since the London meeting, that the G20 has not been as effective in, in handling the issues. And we are always uh, worried about and concerned about the issues of the day rather than Um, the issues which uh, have to do with global stability. 
financial stability and so forth. Would institute an institutionalizing the G20, would structuring it in a different way along the lines maybe of the G7, would that be a more effective way for the G20 to be more impactful? Or you don't think that this would serve any purpose? I think this is a very special time. Not only because for Saudi Arabia, I think G20 next year will be a great opportunity in a lot of sectors, not only in finance. But because I believe uh, if you follow the um, remarks of my colleagues uh, before me, you can image a very clear framework. G20 was born 12 years ago to give an answer to an emergency, financial emergency. And maybe it was a very good, uh, good, uh, uh, audio, good format to solve this emergency. Then, during this period, uh, we stay in front of uh, a lot of uh, transformations. For example, with David, uh, we lived together the, the, the um, difficulties of G8, who became G7 after the crisis with Russia, Ukraine and Russia in 2014. The, the, the first G7 after G8 was in 2014. Uh, Francois remembered the important change in the United Nations the credibility of the United Nations, unfortunately, is uh, different respect to the past. So for all this, that reason, I think G20 today is in a clear, uh, great opportunity. The first is continue, as in the past, continue um, to, to, to solve some emergencies. OK, it's not bad. It is important. Uh, we, for me, my first G G20 was in Australia in 2014, so it was good uh, for the discussion about growth, about... But, okay, it's only... I'm, I'm sorry we didn't meet. I just lost the election. <laughs> <laughs> I lost after. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, but you're coming back. And we cannot discuss about the referendum because myself and David, we ate a referendum <laughs> word. Uh, so, please, we lost the job with the referendum, so we cannot discuss about it. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, um, this is the first possibility. The second is my dream and my advice for you for the next year. G20 could become a brand to change not only a financial discussion uh, will be important, but if you think about next year, you know, G20 in Riyadh will be two weeks after election in America, presidential uh, American election. Will be the first G20 with the new leadership in Europe, Ursula von der Leyen and Charles Michel. The first G20 after Brexit. The first G20 with some maybe. new leaders. Maybe. 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 We don't know. <laughs> maybe. I joke because... Uh, uh, Brexit seems an Italian organization uh, in terms of chaos. <laughs> so it's a made in Italy, David. <laughs> it's a, but for um, the Crown Prince uh, and for all the leadership of this gorgeous country, I think this is a great opportunity. And this is my suggestion. Please invest not only in finance, in economy. Everyone around the world knows how is important and great the, the power of Saudi Arabia in, uh, in uh, economy and in finance. And I think a great idea of IPO of Saudi Aramco, of, uh, Saudi Aramco will be a message very positive in this direction. But G20 could be for you the occasion to give a message different. You are a superpower, not only in economy, but in culture, in tourism, in tradition, in innovation, and also in sustainability. This will be not easy, but it's very important. So this is my, my, my idea. Transform G20, and in this case, you can institutionalize. It's important also because Italy will be the, the, the country who hosts G20 in 2021. But I think, please, Transform G20 
not only a great format to discuss about the economy, but a great opportunity for one year to give to international community an opportunity to try to invest in the future, because the risk is speaking only about the present. Now, politics have to be able to speak about the future. This is my wish for you and for the next G20. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Your Excellency, you are listening very attentively to everyone on, on this panel, but you are the institutional memory. Um, the Prime Ministers were serving for a period of time. You attended all the G20 since 2008 and even beyond when you were Minister of Finance. What is the agenda of the G20 2020 in Saudi Arabia? What is, what is Saudi Arabia planning to do with the G20? Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Basim. Let me uh, join you first uh, in, uh, in uh, appreciating the very successful effort by Yasser and his team in having this tremendous turnaround. In the <laughs> Last year it was uh, called Davos in the Desert, and uh, I believe in the future we should call the other one FII and uh, in the Davos. snow. In the snow. <laughs> So, <laughs> if we keep this attendance. Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, as you mentioned, uh, actually, I have the, the institutional memory, and uh, I want to remind everyone that the G20 started 10 years before the financial crisis, but at the ministerial and central bank uh, governors meeting, and there were calls at that time uh, by particularly the then finance minister of Canada, Paul Martin, to have a heads of state meeting. And uh, thanks to the financial crisis, we started having the, the heads of state uh, meeting in, uh, in November 28, and then uh, after that, March in uh, London. Uh, the agenda. Uh, by the way, we have been preparing for, for uh, the, the presidency of Saudi Arabia for quite some time, and uh, we have high-level meetings headed by the Crown Prince and also other uh, committees preparing for that. But uh, on the agenda, obviously, there are the, the, the outstanding issues like the dealing with the macroeconomic challenges, dealing with the financial regulatory uh, issues, dealing with structural reforms, but in each presidency there will be a specific areas where the interest of the host will be, will be focused on. Uh, in the case of Saudi Arabia, I believe that uh, the, the one of the most important issues is to deal with the empowering women and youth. Wow. This, is, this is very important. And, uh, we have actually, although a short, a short experience, we have been uh, successful in, in that. Uh, this is where the growth will, will be coming from. That's one, one area. The other uh, issue is the, that of the, the uh, sustainable devel development. Uh, Saudi Arabia, by the way, when one looks at it, it's a, a developing country, yet it's a major uh, d uh, donor to, to other countries. It's a major uh, shareholder in the international financial institutions. It's the largest shareholder in many of the, the, the uh, regional uh, financial institutions. <coughs> and of course, it's the, the largest uh, economy in the region. But <coughs> so for the, all of these reasons, Saudi Arabia plays a unique role in the, in the uh, G20. On one side, uh, we are a developing country, as I mentioned, but also we, we are, uh, have common issues with, de with developed countries, and, and that's why we play a bridge between the two. And one of the focus on, the, the, on the, uh, uh, our presidency, uh, the, the issues of developing countries and how to help them and, and how to push the, the uh, goals of uh, sustainable uh, developments the goal, of course, has to be reached by 2030, and hopefully we can push the agenda quicker and uh, reach the, the objectives. These are the main, main things, but of course the environmental issues which have been highlighted by, by uh, the previous speakers will be 
sustainability in sustainability climate change. and the dealing with the climate change in, in a positive way. We have been doing that, and I hope I will have a, a chance to uh, also Please. highlight. Okay. Uh, we we uh, are dealing with it in different uh, ways. One of them is to, to capture carbon. The other is to, to work on developing a compulsion uh, engine with uh, fr friendly to the environment. Uh, third area we are working also on the oil industry in, uh, in capturing gas, not flaring it. One of, uh, we, we are one of the best countries, if not the, the fairest, in, capture, in uh, least flared gas in, in the world, despite, the, of course, the, the large production of oil uh, in, the, in the kingdom. So we want also to push those positive aspects, uh, reforestation, for example, uh, dealing with the desertification. Uh, and as I mentioned, and in a way to help deal with environmental issues and climate change. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Prime Minister Rudd, you are also a coal-producing country. You are one of the largest, hmm. not the largest. Uh, how do you deal with climate change? How do you deal with this issue, sustainability, in a forum like G20? What would you advise Saudi Arabia to do? Well, I think we, uh, as a global community, we uh, take the framework we've agreed, which is um, the Paris Agreement of 2015. That's our framework. And the challenge, therefore, for all of our economies, where e wherever we are on the carbon scale, is to engineer our transition into a smaller carbon economy over time, and ultimately to a zero carbon economy long term. But I'm not going to stand here in the kingdom and be a hypocrite. Uh, we export coal. But our challenge, therefore, in Australia is through measures like mandatory renewable energy targets, through carbon pricing, um, and also the actions of the international investment community to long-term transition from coal through um, liquid nat natural gas through to renewables. Uh, this has to be done in a manner which respects those who work in these industries now, but provides them with real opportunities for change and transformation in the future. I think the other thing I would say is this. The renewable energy revolution is huge. And therefore, when we, from traditional carbon economies, think that this action on climate change represents a threat, what I would say to all of us, including carbon-intensive economies like Australia and Saudi, uh, is that the renewable energy future is a massive opportunity. Uh, when I look, for example, what our neighbors in the UAE are doing at Mazda, uh, the International Renewable Energy Authority, and the great projects which are underway uh, in order to transition our economies globally, this is great stuff for the kingdom to get behind as well. And I'm very pleased to hear what's been said about the centrality of this initiative. One final thought would be this. If you look carefully at renewable energy, there's a role for legislation and laws. Uh, I brought in a law to increase renewable energy from virtually 0% of electricity supply to 20% by 2020. That's been achieved when it was very difficult to start with. But on top of that, there's the technology challenge. Now, what the G20 prevent, presents a massive opportunity to cooperate on what is probably needed, which is a new global moonshot on the next major technological breakthrough on renewables for the future. Uh, Long-term storage, for example, of solar uh, energy in a manner which can become baseload power generation for the future. So rather than seeing these transitions as a threat, let's see them as a huge economic opportunity. And with, if you had the big research industries of China, the United States, the Kingdom, uh, as well as other countries in Europe, in Australia and elsewhere working uh, together in a massive collaborative scientific endeavor, endeavor multi-billion dollar initiative to crack this next threshold that's where so much of the answer lies. You know, I'm, I'm really optimistic when I hear you say this. And, and I think, you know, listening to all of you, I mean, adding SDGs, adding youth and women, adding the issues that uh, the Prime Minister mentioned, 
I think these are all issues that need to be tabled on the agenda of the G20 for it to become more probably relevant or impactful. What would you add in addition to this, uh, Prime Minister Fillon? What would you add as a, on the agenda? What would you suggest to, the Saudi, to Saudi Arabia to add if you were to add one subject on, on the table of the, of the uh, G20? Est-ce que je peux, avant de répondre à cette question, compléter euh, la réponse de Kevin Rudd euh, en disant que cette question de la transition énergétique euh, doit être abordée avec beaucoup de détermination, mais aussi avec beaucoup de pragmatisme Il y a aujourd'hui un danger euh, de dogmatisme dans la mise en œuvre de la transition énergétique. Euh, il y a une sorte de religion euh, monothéiste électrique qui risque de déboucher sur une impasse, qui peut aggraver les inégalités entre les continents et qui ne résoudrait pas complètement la question du réchauffement climatique. Il faut pouvoir développer les énergies renouvelables, il faut pouvoir développer les économies d'énergie, une gestion différente de l'énergie et accepter de regarder les progrès qui sont faits dans des secteurs qui sont considérés comme aujourd'hui euh, euh, dépassés parce qu'ils produisent euh, euh, du CO2. Je prends l'exemple des, des moteurs thermiques. Euh, les moteurs thermiques ont fait des progrès gigantesques et émettent beaucoup moins euh, qu'il y a 5 ans ou qu'il y a 10 ans et ils peuvent encore faire des progrès considérables, à condition que les pouvoirs publics mettent en place des objectifs, des règles, un cadre et laissent euh, les ingénieurs, les chercheurs et le marché euh, trouver les bonnes orientations. Euh, si, par exemple, demain, dans dix ans, l'ensemble des pays européens, euh, des pays développés, euh, utilisent des voitures électriques euh, autonomes, euh, regardez le fossé gigantesque qui va se creuser avec le reste du monde quand euh, une immense partie de l'Afrique n'a même pas accès à l'électricité pour... Euh, euh, la maison pour la lumière ou pour euh, le, le, le réfrigérateur. Euh, il faut donc bien continuer à développer des technologies qui sont euh, des technologies qui vont permettre à l'ensemble de l'humanité de progresser euh, en, en même temps. Et je ne sais pas si le G20 euh, euh, que l'Arabie saoudite va conduire euh, peut contribuer à délivrer ce message parce que l'Arabie saoudite sera immédiatement attaquée euh, par tous les dogmatiques de la Terre qui expliqueront qu'elle défend ses intérêts propres puisqu'elle est pays producteur d'hydrocarbures. De, 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 Mais je pense en même temps qu'il faut avoir le courage de lutter contre ces, ces modes qui s'imposent et qui empêchent, au fond, aux, aux, aux êtres humains de réfléchir, de faire leurs propres choix. Et, et donc voilà, si l'Arabie saoudite peut... Euh, dans cette question de la transition énergétique, euh, apporter du réalisme, du pragmatisme. Tout à l'heure, M. Agag expliquait que euh, les formules électriques iraient bientôt plus vite que les, les Formule 1. Peut-être pas. Si euh, demain, les Formule 1 marchent à l'hydrogène euh, et que cet hydrogène est produit en Arabie saoudite parce qu'il faut beaucoup d'électricité pour produire l'hydrogène, et, et, et qu'à partir du solaire, on peut produire de l'hydrogène à bas coût, eh bien peut-être que M. Aya aura tort et que les Formule 1 iront plus vite que les Formules E. Merci bien. Prime Minister, I, I had lunch with the Prime Minister, the, with the Dr. Rad before. I had the pleasure of having lunch with him. And he said something very valuable to me. He said, there are calls for decoupling and they in Australia would like not to be in a position where they have to choose between the United States and China. He would argue for more coupling rather than decoupling. Italy has had an agreement, or several agreements with China, and you have been a, uh, a big uh, partner of China in many ways and asking for more European partnership with China. What would you say to that? Would Would this be, uh, be a good thing to do? How would the G20 diplomacy deal with this? I think G20 is the only format uh, good for a frank speaking between leaders uh, uh, out of bilateral relations. So um, 
For example, between USA and China, G20 is particularly important. But G20 apart, we know we are in front of a great uh, change of uh, situation in uh, geopolitical uh, world because uh, USA and China have a relation uh, very strong and very hard and rich of problem and opportunities. I think the real question is not what is the role of Italy in that, but maybe what is the role of Europe? Because uh, we discussed about the growth of Asia. Yesterday, Prime Minister Modi explained that very clearly. Uh, we are in front of a great power and possibilities of Africa, some president of Africa, two days ago, here, in, on yes, this, this stage, gave a lot of um, ideas about the future. And uh, if it's correct, the um, remarks of François Fillon, it's very interesting to discuss about uh, hydrogen and solar in the north of Africa and the relation with Europe. So we have a lot of new change around the world. The real problem is, what is the role of Europe? This is the big question for us. Okay, Italy signed an agreement with China um, with a lot of polemics, but uh, I think uh, uh, the, the real point is decide as European institution a position in front of that. My idea is very clear. The relation between Europe and USA will be the pillar of every initiative for the next years. It's not the past, it's also the present, and in my view, also the future. For that, it's important uh, to change the mind of some of our European partners, but also to push White House to give more attention about Europe. This is the first, because uh, uh, this depends particularly in this moment uh, on the relation between EU and uh, USA. But at the same time, we need a different relation with China. Because in the last 10 years, some countries of Europe, particularly Germany, used China as the first market. The business model of growth of Germany in the last 10, 15 years was totally based on the growth of export with, uh, with the China. Not only China, but particularly China. And this was also a discussion during our summit in European Council. Because, for example, uh, the rules of European uh, uh, institution don't permit too much commercial surplus. So, in other words, I think we need a different relation with China. Just to be very brief in the remarks about this point. First, Europe has to change the legislation about competition. Because if European rules blocked Siemens and Alstom, just to make one example, that it's a mistake. It's not a good thing for consumers. It's a problem for capacity, productivity, and competitiveness of Europe around the world. Second point. It's impossible to accept 5G will be only a competition between uh, China and South Korea and, in part, uh, USA. We need an European answer, who today is not present. And for everything of that point, I believe G20 could be a place, this is important, of complexity. Let me be very uh, clear in the conclusion. Particularly in uh, Western societies, the idea is uh, a, we are in front of a growth of populism. Who is populism? Populism is a lot of things. But we can uh, give this uh, quote. Populism is the capacity to give easy solution to great and complexity of problem. But it's impossible to give an answer very clear with a tweet, with a post on Facebook, on the post on Instagram, to great problem of globalization, of change, of innovation. So what 
it's particularly important today for the leaders, for the politicians, particularly politicians who have the problem of consensus day by day, month by month, year by year. The real question is have a platform of study and stay in face and in front of complexity. And that is exactly what G20 could have to is true for uh, energetic uh, transition, as uh, Fillon remember, but is it true also for the relation between uh, uh, geopolitical world. My wish is in 2020, before G20, USA and China will sign an agreement on trade. This is my hope and my wish because this is important. Uh, I think it's important for 0 0.5, one point of GDP, global GDP around the world. Second point, I think it's important Europe come back to play a role in the innovation and not only to be spectator in the match, because the risk is there is a match between USA and China, and European people are the spectators. But who I want to play, I want to see uh, a lot. I, I think it's Thank important you. play, not only watch. Prime Minister, you wanted to add something. Oh, just something very briefly. The truth is the elephant in the room of the next G20 is the US and China. Let's be very blunt about it. We can be here. Uh, none of us are in office at the moment. Um, but the bottom line is this. It now hangs as a shadow over every domain of policy that we're engaged in. It would be good if the G18, that is the G20 minus the United States and China, was to say to the G2, China and the United States, please stop any thought of decoupling, either in trade or investment or in capital markets or in technology or in currency. Because if you do that, it's bad for both of you and it's bad for the global economy, but also it's bad for all of the rest of us because then we are faced unnecessarily, in my view, with an emerging set of binary choices. And to build on what uh, our good friend Francois Fillon said before, you know, we decided after the Second World War to build the institutions of multilateralism, the United Nations, the G7, the G20, here in the Gulf, the GCC. Why? Because we decided that national solutions were just dangerous because it becomes the power of the law of the jungle. To rediscover through this next G20 the principle of why we chose to be multilateral, to deal with complexity, as Prime Minister Renzi has just said, is actually a rediscovery of an ancient truth applied to future circumstances. So my call would be get the G18 to work on the G2. Prime Minister Cameron. I'm a, I mean, like, like Kevin, I'm a convinced multilateralist. I mean, these institutions are often imperfect, but they're the best we've got, and we should encourage everyone uh, to work through them. The only thing I'd say to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia contemplating your G20 is you're not fully in control, and no one is fully in control, of when China and the U.S. are going to solve their issues and their problems. And I think there is a connection between this question about do you want the G20 to be more institutionalized and what issues should you address? My argument would be if you make it more institutionalized, I think it will just become another forum where everyone gets together and has the same arguments for and against climate change, for and against protectionism, and you won't achieve anything. Uh, so I, I think the strength of the G20 is it's at leader level. And so I think if you take the issue of climate change, which my colleagues were talking about, I absolutely agree. Focus on technology and the potential for change rather than just the argument about who needs to do more. Otherwise, it just simply becomes another way of um, America versus the rest arguing about the IPCC. So let me give you another issue on the, on the climate front where actually you can make a huge difference, which is the state of our oceans. Because even climate change deniers or climate change skeptics like the current American administration, they accept that we need to clean up our oceans and get rid of the plastic. Now, there is a connection between that and climate change. Britain has created one of the largest marine reserves anywhere in the world. America has followed suit um, near Hawaii. Every country that borders an ocean 
can actually make progress by declaring marine reserves and areas we're going to allow you know, coral to be refurbished and the oceans a chance to breathe again, clearing out the plastic and the rest of it. That's exactly the sort of the issue that at leader level you make a big difference rather than just replay all the traditional arguments between the enthusiasts for climate change action, like myself, and the less enthusiastic uh, countries, and we know who they are. So that would be my, my advice. Thank you very much. <laughs> Your Excellency, I'm sure you have a lot of comments about what you heard, but I have a question for you as well. Uh, Riyadh will be the first Arab capital to ever host a G20. Saudi Arabia is the first Arab country ever to host a G20. So you have a Saudi agenda, and you have a lot to be proud of. And you have a regional agenda and a lot of concerns to carry on your shoulders because this region is not a happy region. Uh, what, what will you do? Do you table the issues of the region, the development of the region? Do you put it in front of the G20? Do you deal with it? How do you deal with it when you're Saudi Arabia and you're hosting the first G20 in an Arab country? Mm. Sure. And let me just be, before this, uh, I'll make a comment on uh, the point of uh, carbon-based economy versus renewables. Saudi Arabia uh, did not ignore the, uh, uh, the uh, renewable resources uh, and the, their development. Actually, we have already invested a lot in uh, renewable resources, particularly, particularly the uh, solar and wind powers. Uh, but, and we already produce desalinated water using solar energy, electricity. Probably we are the largest uh, country in the region in investing in uh, renewables. Uh, the people who watched the, the uh, session before this one noticed that we also are investing in uh, electric cars and um, uh, hosting the e-formula, et cetera. So we, we are not just focusing on the, the uh, the, the uh, oil uh, uh, resources. Uh, on your question regarding the, the uh, being the first Arab country hosting the G20 and what's that, what does that mean for our region? Uh, indeed, as I mentioned at the beginning, that, that uh, being a developing country, we will put more focus on, on the issues of development, including in our region. Uh, I, I expect that we will have some emphasis on, on the issues in uh, our region, whether they are development issues or other, other challenges. So, so th this is going to be part of the, the, uh, the, uh, the agenda of, uh, uh, of Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much, sir. I want to ask you, Prime Minister Cameron, a year in politics is a very long period. Mm -hmm. Now, despite the fact 24, that... 24 hours is quite a long time <laughs> in, in British politics at the moment. And a year in global politics is even longer. But, and, and through the process, obviously, Saudi Arabia is going to chaperone all these Sherpas and all these events with the business, with culture for, for a whole year. It's a year process. Mm. But what would you predict, if you were to guess, what would be the political climate like? What would we have in store? What would change from now until next November 2020 when Saudi Arabia hosts the summit for the G20? Well, I, I would expect that um, many of the issues we're debating right now will still be very hot topics. So next trade October. war will still, t still... So I think even if we have an agreement between China and the United States, and I hope we will, we still have a U.S. president who is fundamentally quite protectionist. That's the way he thinks. And the G20 is before the next American election. So even if you have a solution, there's still going to be a battle where you'll have... Britain and Germany and Italy and France and other Australia saying please no more protectionist me measures let's roll back the protectionism we'll see and you'll have countries uh, that will be more appropriate that, that argument will still be going on uh, the argument about climate change uh, where we need urgent action that will still be um, taking place uh, I think we can be confident of that uh, I think there's there's another issue which will still be very current um, will be the issue of how we deal with extremist terrorism and violence. Yes, we've seen a huge success with the destruction of the uh, ISIS uh, caliphate in, in Syria and Iraq, but there's still going to be this problem in our societies, including in Britain and in France and Italy and Australia. We all have problems with uh, extremism and violence, and I think the G20 can have a role there because, of course, 
you've got some of the great uh, Muslim nations um, and Muslim populations represented around that table with Indonesia, with Saudi Arabia, with, with India, which has a huge uh, Muslim population. And so often in the West, I think we're getting this wrong, uh, this debate and understanding about um, the fact that some people have perverted what is a great world religion. And we should be combining all the countries of the G20 to discuss that. So I think the issues we're discussing now, I'm sure will be discussed then. If you want me to predict whether Brexit will have actually happened by uh, the next G20, I think it probably uh, will have. We have an election underway in the United Kingdom, uh, and I suspect that um, we will come to the next G20, not as members of the European Union, but as the sixth largest economy in the world. We will be friends and neighbors and partners of the European Union are able to work together on all of the issues that are concerned in Europe, whether that is the relationship we should have with China, whether it is working together with the United States, whether it is dealing with, with issues of regional security and the rest. So I think you'll have a very full agenda. My, my argument is, of course, use the G20 to address that agenda, but don't waste the opportunity of having the world leaders together to push on agendas where you can make a real difference on global poverty, on failed states, on making sure oil and natural resources are a blessing, not a curse, on how we tackle uh, extremism and violence and terrorism in our world. This is going to be a moment when uh, Saudi Arabia is in this position of great leadership. And what I found with my G8 is that, yes, you have the big discussions. We had a huge argument about the future of Syria with Putin around the table uh, with others. But actually, it was the action we took to make dementia a global issue in many ways that I look back on one of the things I'm proudest of, because you can drive other agendas at your G20 or at your G8 that can have a life long after mm. everyone has packed up and left a Riyadh, after what I'm sure will be a very successful meeting. Thank you. Dr. Brahim, one last question. Saudi Arabia has a lot to be proud of in showing and showcasing the other G20 members what you have done in the last four years in education, in reform, in diversification, even in climate change and, and sustainability. What would you recommend to the Saudi leadership that the G20 2020 in Riyadh should be remembered for? Well, I just want to, to make uh, one uh, short comment on uh, Prime Minister Cameron's uh, point about the dealing with the other issues. Uh, I recall that we had very lively discussions in previous uh, G20s uh, with regard de with dealing with political issues, that the G20 should focus on economic issues and leave the political issues aside. Other they are very important. You remember when you have some, 20 leaders around the table, it's always difficult to leave the political well, issues to you one were, side. You, you were there in St. Petersburg. I remember that very well. Yeah, we, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but, it's not uh, a conversation I want to remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But uh, anyway, well, uh, I'm sure the, the, our leadership will work uh, on all the issues that, that can help, the, whether it's the, the economic uh, well-being or, or, of course, uh, political um, uh, st stability. On your question, I want to remember, uh, or I hope that the world will remember uh, the, the summit for achieving uh, the sustainable growth. Everybody knows now we are, the, the growth of the world economy is slowing down. Some people predict recession. But I hope that we can work together with the rest of the G20 to bring back the, the, uh, the uh, growth of the world economy and to also deal with the poverty uh, issue. And as I mentioned several times, the issue of the sustainable development and achieving the goals uh, of, of, uh, of uh, development. This is, this is as SDGs, exactly. This is very important to us. We wish you great success, Your Excellency. We wish the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia great success in its upcoming presidency. And on behalf of everybody, I want to thank you. I want to thank this very distinguished panel. See you next year, everybody. Thank you.